Here I'll be going through and trying to differentiate between the combined gas law and the ideal gas law, when to use each, how to know which one to use, and a little bit on how they relate to each other. The combined gas law, we're going to deal with this whenever we're looking at a case where we're changing conditions. And so here we're looking for, is my pressure, volume, or temperature changing? The restrictions for this one, your temperature has to be in kelvins. And then you have actually quite a bit of flexibility with your units for pressure and volume. The units just have to match on both sides. So if my volume over here is in liters, this volume needs to be in liters in order for me to have that function. Okay. Uh, at that point, though, your pressure can be any pressure unit. So PSI, kilopascals, atmospheres, uh, millimeters of mercury, inches of mercury, tor, bar, whatever, it doesn't matter. Volume, same thing, milliliters, centimeters cubed, decimeters cubed, meters cubed, liters, whatever. As long as they're both the same on both sides, those units will cancel and it won't make any difference. The ideal gas law is different. The ideal gas law is kind of based on a single moment in time. Here are the relationships between these four variables in your, in your equation here. So P is pressure, V is volume, T is temperature, just like in the, in the other equation. But here we have moles. And then we also have a gas constant. Now, I use two of the gas constants. There are more. Uh, but I use 0.0821. This is going to be what you use when your pressure is in atmospheres. The other one is 8.314. That's what you're going to use when your pressure is in kilopascals. This one is a little more physics-based. And so if you go on and do some other things with, with um, higher things in chemistry and you see RT for an energy calculation you're going to be using the 8.314 for that. So the biggest distinguishments between these are that for the PV over T equals PV over T you're changing the conditions. So in a problem like this you're going to see here's our pressure to begin, here's our pressure at the end, how did the temperature change or something to that effect. You do not have to see all three things at once. So if pressure, or let's say temperature is constant or pressure or volume or whatever, if one of these three variables is constant, what will happen is you'll have the same value before and after, and those will cancel from the equation. So if you notice that if you take the temperatures out of this calculation, you're left with PV equals PV, that's Boyle's law. So in the case of temperature being constant, you can drop that temperature from the calculation, and you'll end up with Boyle's law. If your pressure is constant, then pressure will drop out of that equation, you'll get V over T equals V over T, now you're looking at Charles's law. If volume is constant, you'll end up with gay lussacs law. So PV equals NRT, on the other hand, is just a singular equation you're plugging in. You're going to have to choose which R value to use based on your pressure unit. Your volume must be in liters. Moles has to be in moles. And, a, and of course, your temperature has to be in kelvins. It is consistent that no matter what calculation you're doing, your temperature does need to be in kelvins no matter what. So these are kind of the two equations to pick from. For this one, we're really looking for, does the problem involve moles? That's the big distinguishing factor between these two equations, is moles. So if I'm asked for or given moles, then the odds are I'm going to be using that equation, unless I'm given a trick question, I'm going to be using the PV equals NRT. So let's go ahead and look at some examples, and then go through and look at what we would pick for them. So here, we have a gas occupying 12.3 liters, a certain pressure, what's the volume when the pressure is increased? So the fact that the pressure is changing here, where it says the pressure is increased, that's indicative that I'm going to be using my combined gas law. Now a good way to confirm that is just to write down what I know. I have 12.3 liters, that's a volume. Pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury, that's a pressure. And it says what would the volume be when the pressure is increased to 60 millimeters of mercury. So in this particular problem, okay, I'm looking at a pressure, a volume, a pressure, and a volume. That means that I'm going to be using pressure, volume, over temperature equals pressure, volume, over temperature. And in this case, my temperatures are constant. So anytime they omit something from there, you, you're, you're pretty safe to assume that that means that those are held constant. So I'm really I'm looking at Boyle's law simplified down from the combined gas law. Now, in this next one, it says how many moles. So right away, when it says moles, that's an indicator that you're using PV equals NRT. And this is not an exception to that. Moles of gas to be present in a gas trapped with a 37 liter vessel. So here's our volume. 
at 80 degrees Celsius, so our temperature, and I would immediately convert that into Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, not into Fahrenheit, into Kelvin. So 353 Kelvins at a pressure of 2.50 atmospheres. So here we have a pressure, temperature, and volume. The thing we're missing is moles. Because our pressure is in atmospheres, the R we would use would be our 0 0.0821. And then we'll go ahead and plug those things in and solve for n to get the moles on there. Now, besides ideal gas law and combined gas law, the other things that you need to be aware of for gas laws and pressure calculations, you need to know all of your pressures. So you need to know all of the standard pressures, millimeters of mercury. You want to know atmospheres, kilopascals, PSI, and then you want to be familiar with the fact that these four pressures are all equal to each other. Those are all representative of standard pressures. So 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure is equivalent to one atmosphere. And so I can use those for conversions. You want to know your units for volume are going to be milliliters, or liters, or centimeters cubed, or decimeters cubed, or meters cubed. Uh, I, I would also add in that you probably should know that a centimeter cubed is equal to a milliliter and then a decimeter cubed is equal to a liter. Temperature, you're going to be working in Kelvin, so we don't really need to go through, but do know how to convert something into Kelvins. Then there are some side things. You want to understand what diffusion is. I actually switch this color. There we go. So that can come out a little better. You want to understand the difference between diffusion and effusion. Both of these kind of involve the motion of gases in a little bit in a different manner, but they have very similar characteristics. Diffusion is just a gas or, or something in a fluid spreading out. Uh, and so, so if you ever have put food coloring into, into a dish of water and you watch the food coloring kind of spread, that's what diffusion is. Uh, if I were to spray cologne in here, that scent would smell, through, or would, would smell and spread throughout the room. Uh, the diffusion is kind of the spreading of a substance kind of through its own motion as, as time goes on. Effusion is more based on something leaking out of a pin-sized hole. And this is actually useful in chemical engineering because if you set up a container that has a very tiny hole in it, and then a gas is in that container, that gas will every once in a while hit this hole and leak. So there'll be a leak from that. Well, keep in mind that at a given temperature, different gases will move at different speeds based on their molar mass. And so, some of the gases will hit this hole more frequently because they'll be moving faster, and so therefore they'll collide with the surface more frequently. So a smaller gas in molar mass will, will diffuse out of that container faster, so the heavier gas will be left behind. And so I can use this to separate gases from each other to some degree. Okay, now diffusion is very similar to that, it's just not locked into the hole component, it's just the spreading out of a gas in any container, even the size of a room. Now both of those are governed by what's called Graham's Law, and the premise behind Graham's law is that you have equivalent kinetic energies for a sample of a gas at the same temperature. So if I have a blue gas and a yellow gas, and they have equivalent kinetic energies, but let's say that the mass of this is different than the mass of that. What I can do is I can rearrange this equation to kind of end up with my masses on one side and my velocity is on the other side. And then I can square root both of those sides and come up with the following equation. I can end up with that the ratio of my velocities is equal to the square root of the ratio of my masses. Now for me, I recommend the following. I recommend that you know that smaller things, smaller masses or gases will be faster they'll have a larger velocity vector. And so when we're looking at this calculation, what I would do is I would do the ratio of the molar masses and square root, whatever that comes out to be some number. But then when I'm looking to find an answer, I would just go, which one is smaller? I would use my answer here as the ratio for how much faster that smaller thing will be. So if we look at an example of that, um, let's go ahead and clear some room here. So if I'm looking at an example with something like, here's methane and here's helium. 
Okay, and I say to you that methane moves at 100 meters per second at a given temperature. How fast will helium move? The molar masses of these are approximately 16 and 4. So if I'm plugging in the ratio of those, I'm looking at 16 divided by 4, and then I'm square rooting. So square root of 16 over 4 is plus or minus 2. So in this case, obviously plus. So one is twice as fast as the other. Then I would go through and look at my look at my problem here. The methane is 16, the helium is 4. I would then label this as being my faster of the two based on the fact that the smaller mass will be compensated by the larger velocity. The velocity of this is then two times faster than the velocity of that. These helium atoms must then be moving at 200 meters per second, while the methane are averaging 100 meters per second. Okay. The last thing that's involved in gas laws besides diffusion and effusion is Dalton's law of partial pressure. Usually when you see Dalton's law of partial pressure for the first time, you're kind of curious as to why that's even being taught because it looks so simple. Uh, the idea is that your total pressure of a mixture of gas is equal to each of those pressures of the individual gases added together for as many as you have. Now, if this is 10 and this is 20, then the total is 30. If there's another one with the pressure of 50, the total is 80. The adding up is not the idea behind teaching this. We're not trying to test whether you can add or not. The point of Dalton's law is that there's a very simple experiment that we do in chemistry a lot. And Dalton's law is very important with relationship to that. The idea is if you wanted to collect a gas. So if I'm doing an experiment and I want to collect a bunch of oxygen to make a really cool fire. The way that I would do that is I would do collecting a gas over water. And so I would fill up a container of water all the way and then submerge it upside down into some kind of bigger container filled with water. The water will remain pushed up all the way into here when I submerge it under water. But then I can go ahead and hook up some kind of tubing where I can bubble in a gas into here that will push the water out. And so I'll fill up this container with whatever gas is in here. Well, there's a big problem with this. And that is that in addition to gas, let's call it gas A that's in here, there's one more thing. There's steam present. So the fact that I'm collecting this over a water surface means that I'm also producing invisible steam that's going up into the top in there and it's mixing with the two. Well, what's nice about this is when the water level becomes equal to the outside, I know the pressure total inside of that container. It's equal to the external atmospheric pressure. Okay? But I want to know the pressure of gas A. Well, the problem with that is that in order to get that, I have to recognize the fact that there is also some steam present contributing some of the pressure, and that gas A is just the rest of that. So if I have standard atmospheric pressure, outside 760 millimeters of mercury, let's say, what I can do is I can look up what the vapor pressure of the water is on a table based on the temperature of the water, and I can get this value. So this value is probably going to be something small. Let's say it's 22 millimeters of mercury. Well, then I know that the pressure of gas A is 738 millimeters of mercury based on that calculation. And I want to use 738 and not the total of 760. I want to account for the fact that there's two gases in there, not just a pure sample of A, that I've collected it over water. And the collection over water is why we introduced Dalton's Law at this point in the class. So really, the idea here is very simple. You're adding up the pressures to give a total, but the application is through this specific problem.